Hey guys, I came over here near Thunder Hill on the parkway to help kind of capture a little bit of this last scene in Jonah. So we're gonna look at the last scene in light of a handful of key words that I'm gonna explore with you. So the bulk of this video will be exploring these key words, gadol and ra'ah. Yay! All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of a contextualized word study, and I know that sounds fancy, but what I mean by that is we're gonna take a look at the, the way the author uses a couple of key words in the book of Jonah to shed some light on a theology of God. So I know this sounds a bit weird, but we're gonna look at two words, gadol and ra'ah, and we're going to have fun kind of tracing them out through different translations. And as we'll see, there's an advantage here of, of looking at multiple translations. Perhaps a word in Hebrew carries a different nuance than a word in English. Uh, so you need multiple English words to convey all of that. Imagine the word run in English, right? You know how flexible the word run is in English? All of these are different ways to use the same verb. So if you're going to translate that into another language, they might actually parse that out into more particular uh, categories. So let's take a look at this first word, gadol. So if uh, Hebrew reads uh, right to left, so this is a G, a D, and an L, gadol. And it means, generally speaking, great, big, large. It could it mean a status, like importance. But generally speaking, it, it just means big. I've highlighted almost all the uses of this word gadol in the book of Jonah, I, I, with one exception. Ironically enough, I left out dog gadol, which is fish big, or as we would put it in English, big fish. Let's just try to get this sense here of, of is there something going on here at the wordplay that maybe through the word gadol, great, big, large, important, that God is actually conveying something about Nineveh. And why would I say that? Well, that's the first way we're introduced to the word Nineveh. So arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, a great city, right? Is it talking about the size of the city, perhaps? Is it talking about the importance of the city, perhaps? It's a little unclear. It is a great city. Uh, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest. See, there was got two different translations of the same uh, word, probably just for variety's sake, but that's the same in the Hebrew, a great tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. All right, so we've got a big wind, a big important storm. It's probably more size than importance, right? Um, but then the men were uh, exceedingly afraid, and, and that seems weird to highlight there, exceedingly. That's kind of far away from, from great or large or big. Uh, in, in, in the Hebrew, the idiom is more like they feared a big fear. For I know that it is because of me that we go with the reference to the storm. Great tempest has come upon you. Again, probably the size, the scale of the storm, uh, maybe more than the importance. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Here's that fear, a big fear again. And they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So response to God is characterized in part by their, the size or the significance of their fear. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Again, the word Nineveh is associated with this. Is it, is it talking about the size of the city? Is it talking about the importance of the city? Well, let's find out and call out against it. The message I tell you. Okay, so we've got to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is described as this word, Gadol. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a great city to God. See, this is really interesting. So uh, off, you might see in some translations that it's an exceedingly great city or something like that. But in the Hebrew, and I, and I just I wrote the literal translation here, and it's in a footnote from the ESV. A great city to God is, is what it literally says. So a great city to God. D did, did God need to affirm that it was that it, its size was big, or is that readily observable? Or is this talking about greatness in terms of significance? In other words, is this saying that the city is important to God? Mm -hmm. Okay, so interesting little note here that the narrator is using. Perhaps this repeated use of the word gadol is taking on a bit of a different nuance. 
And the people of Nineveh believed God. They, they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Okay, so like everybody, and this is probably status, right? I don't know that they're talking about the size of their clothes. It's, it's basically saying everybody did it, even, even the king, as we'll see. And uh, he, the king published a, a proclamation, and by decree of the king and his nobles... See, do you see that that interesting translation? There are many words for figures in the court of a king in Hebrew, and here the author is choosing to use the word gadol. They're great ones. It's it's the high up. It's the people who are important. It is their status is significant. Is the author continuing to shape our view of this word and how we're supposed to read it? And then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up to provide shade over Jonah's head to ease his discomfort. Jonah was greatly displeased. So for Jonah, the, the, the thing that is of great importance or size to him is his displeasure with a plant that ended up dying. So I just want to put that in perspective. I do think this is really interesting to point out. This is not the word that we're, we're looking at, but, but what, what does greatness mean? mean to God here and here's where I kind of I'm trying to land the plane so the Lord said you cared about the plant right it stirred a great a significant a large response in Jonah the plant which you did not labor or did not grow it appeared in a night and it perished in a night should I not care about the great city of Nineveh which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left as well as many animals and so what we have here, guys, is a, an idea that, that perhaps at the beginning of this exploration, the thing that, that, that was pointed out about Nineveh, that, that maybe God isn't describing the size of the city, although that is made clear. It takes Jonah three days to visit. What's interesting is the significance of Nineveh. So let's just kind of chart this out. Gadol is literally a great, big, large uh, figuratively, what does this suggest? Importance. Importance. So what I, what I want to hear is, why did God send up one of his prophets all the way to Nineveh? And it's, it's this simple fact. This place is important to God. Hey, buddy. Do you want to say hey? Okay. What God cares about, we should care about. All right. We got that? Gadol. Important, great, big, large. And here the narrator is trying to show us that the response to seeing something as important is caring about it. Ra'ah. So this is, this is wickedness, uh, often translated as wickedness, evil. It could even mean calamity. Uh, so it, it moves from, it, it has a range of meaning that moves from uh, the idea of, of active pursuing something bad to someone receiving or being stuck in something bad. So what is intended? What is the author trying to convey with this word in the book of, of Jonah? Is there wordplay here that sheds some light on God's perspective on the subject? Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Again, a great city important city and call out against it for their evil has come up before me. The original occasion for God sending a prophet to Nineveh was their ra'ah, their wickedness. Is it wickedness? Is it calamity? And the translator here has opted for evil. And they said to one another, uh, this is later on, the, the, the boat people, boat people, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. All right, so you, you catch that. Evil. What are they talking about? They're talking about the storm. They're talking about this. The, what they're referring to here is the, the storm, the scenario. Is, 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 that, is that best translated as evil? If, if, if ra'a could mean evil or wickedness, it could also mean calamity, like, you know, kind of like a tragedy of an accident. Which one of these seems to suggest is correct here? So let's just hold that intention. Is there wordplay here that our translations are limiting us uh, and preventing us from seeing well? Uh, so then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come. Again, referring to the storm. We're, we're back in Nineveh. Jonah has arrived and he's, and he's given the message and the people are responding to God. Everybody in the city to, to repent, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from 
from, so turning from his evil way and from the violence in his hand. So this is a this is a, a parallel, right? That evil and violence are held next to each other. So we can very pretty confidently say what's intended here is, is, is wickedness. Now, does that mean that it, it dismisses any concept of calamity from this? No, not exactly, but this is obviously that if they're turning from, from evil acts, right, that this, this is talking about uh, the wickedness that they would, they would do more than receive. Uh, so when, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, right, they're turning from it, just like the usage we just used above, the word appears again, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. Did you guys catch, the, did you catch that? Oh, check this out, guys, that that God here relented of the disaster. And that word highlighted in red there, bolded in red, disaster is the same word, ra'ah. So God wouldn't do wickedness to someone, would he? He can't do that. He's not evil. He wouldn't characterize his behavior as wicked. But would he relent of the calamity that he was going to bring on them? Would he pause and reconsider that? And I would say... That is interesting, right? That these two uses of the same word are back to back in the same sentence. So we're, we're sensing a multi-layered picture of how to translate and read Ra'ah in the book of Jonah. In other words, uh, we're, we're compositing a view of wickedness and calamity that seem to be a little bit more ambiguous. But Jonah was greatly displeased, and this is the verbal form. So the thing that, that causes this, you know, this he is calamitized. He, is, he, is, he, he feels like it's wicked what has happened. And so do you see that, 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 that upon this wickedness, God is relenting. But Jonah is frustrated that God relented. Do you see how out of sync Jonah is with God? And he prayed to the Lord. And he said, oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster guys this here is a quote from Exodus chapter 34 verses uh, I've got it down here verses 6 and through 7 it's the divine name it's it's exactly a quote from there, from from uh, gracious God, merciful soul to anger, bounding in steadfast love, and and this is not a quote; it's a paraphrase of God's character, the part that Jonah doesn't like. And what is that part of God's character that Jonah doesn't like? The part where he relents from disaster. So the ASV did it very woodenly, just to show you that this is the same word. Repentest thee of evil is how the ASV has this. We're swimming in a bit of theological ambiguity here. Are, are you suggesting that God is causing evil and that he is available to repent? Or, because of the range of meanings that we have in this word that the original audience would have understood, and we have to see this through translation, that what is meant here, relenting from disaster, is the accurate way to see this. And I, I, I would opt for that. I think the ESV has a great translation. But there is wordplay and there's ambiguity and it makes you think. And if you were an original reader of this and you knew that these words could mean multiple things, by the end of it, when you hear God saying that he is relenting of the ra'ah, what is his response to ra'ah? At the beginning it seems like confrontation and at the end it seems like reconciliation. So which is it? What do we do in the face of ra'ah, of wickedness, of calamity? Do we, uh, do we hold the people uh, that are accountable that are committing wickedness, or do we see them bound to their wicked ways as a disaster, a calamity upon which to have mercy on? And Jonah, what is ra'ah? What is this concept, wickedness or calamity? Let me, let me try to summarize it. Evil is a calamity. I'll repeat that. Evil is a calamity. A calamity and let me let me say it this way when one repents God relents when one repents God relents relentment is the act of relenting of softening it is God's response 
Yatara'ah, the wickedness of Nineveh, was met with relentment. So let me put it this way. That relentment and the, the repentance that came, that it, from which it came was born out of confrontation, which is a prophetic task. The thing is, Jonah's very, 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 very comfortable with that part of the prophetic tax, the confrontation, pointing out other people's wickedness. But also, God's response is reconciliation. So guys, when we see wickedness, we must interpret it also as calamity. Because it's not confrontation for confrontation's sake. It's confrontation for the hope of repentance and relentment and reconciliation. Our response when we see wickedness, guys, is not simply to point it out. That is part of it. Confrontation is part of it. This whole occasion of Nineveh repenting, sitting in ashes and sackcloth, attending to the presence of God, that restoration with him would not have been possible if Jonah had not pronounced to them that they were out of sync with the living God. But when someone admits that they're out of sync with the living God, there comes the amazing and merciful character of God which made Jonah so upset that his response to calamity is mercy in relenting. And so what we have here is God wanting to restore relationship that he views the wickedness of humanity as a calamity. It is both and. This is all clear from the wordplay in the book of Jonah. So I hope this is helpful and I hope it causes us to see wickedness as calamity. That when we are making bad decisions or out of sync with God, yes, it, it, it will feel like confrontation when God calls us out. But what is his goal? His goal is restoration, reconciliation, that he would pity us in the calamity of our own sin and stir in us a reconnection to him as he did with the Ninevites. So the reason I did all of that intense word study for you is because Jonah, at the end of his whole prophetic ministry in Nineveh, well, he sits outside the city, and the reason I'm here is um, on a clear day, you can see Charlotte just over there sticking up on the horizon like a barcode. It's a hazy day, so unfortunately I couldn't quite get it in the shot. But he sits east of the city waiting for it to burn, and this thing happens with a plant. So let's read about that. Jonah is sitting outside of the city and a plant grows up to give him shade. God appoints this plant and it grows and, and he gets so angry when that plant withers away. And you can see that God is challenging Jonah through this plant. That if Jonah cares more about this plant than that city, then something isn't quite right about his perspective. He is bathed in pouty prophet pessimism. The reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh was because of God's character and God's compassion, his relenting of the calamity. We see that Jonah is not really listening or hearing his own people's narrative of repentance very well because God's people found themselves at odds with God in the very scene that this text is from. So let's dive into that real quick. So as we can see, guys, when we don't see the idols in our own lives and we don't see how God has forgiven us from our own wickedness and rescued us from our own calamity, then we will be ill-equipped to understand a God who is relenting of disaster, who is forgiving of wickedness, and we might end up pouting 
over something small rather than celebrating the big and beautiful character of God. What God cares about, we must care about. And that city over there is something God cares about. God cares about people. He cares about their issues. He cares about the calamities that they're in. So what you hear on the news, what you hear about other people, what you hear about the whole world, would you, like God, be challenged to care and to see what is going on as important? So let our hearts be stirred to move when we see people in pain, in calamity, in disaster. Let us be a people who don't pout about the character of God, but a people that celebrate it and embody it. Okay, I hope this has been a fun exploration with Jonah. We're beginning a semester-long study of the book of Amos, and I think you guys will find it quite an adventure. So, uh, Godspeed, and we'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>